Assalamu alaikum. My name is Suleiman Ijaz. I head strategy at Engro Corporation. Our team has written a thought paper about COVID-19, which attempts to answer with best available information what it will take for Pakistan to stop the pandemic and what will be the corresponding impact on the economy. Uh, this video is a brief summary of that paper. You can find the full paper on Engro's Knowledge Center. There will be a link in the description. It's publicly available. And I would like to acknowledge in alphabetical order the hard work done by Danish, Hussain, Saad, Sheldon, Omer and Zulfiqar in putting together this document. So, having said that, what is COVID-19? It is a respiratory condition caused by a virus, SARS-CoV-2. What is SARS-CoV-2? It's a tiny little spiky ball of genetic material covered with chemicals called lipids. This little thing gets into your cells makes copies of itself, bursts out and generally infects the body. Most people, as, as, as you would know, 80% of people uh, beat this thing with mild or, or, or no symptoms. Ironically, this is what causes the condition to spread because people act as carriers of the virus before they realize they have symptoms or without ever realizing they have symptoms. Uh, just a couple of Pakistan specific observations. People above 70 are most vulnerable to this thing. And our population is only 3% above 70, compared to say Italy where 17% of people are above 70. Um, so hopefully that is a cause for cautious optimism that our mortality rates might be low. Also, certain pre-existing conditions lead to higher mortality rates and for a number of them, Pakistan has a lower incidence than the rest of the world. So again, cause for cautious optimism, although other factors may and probably will move against us. Um, this is the critical chart. The rest of the document just talks about the consequences of this page. We've laid out three scenarios of government response and their implication. Uh, two are just there as a comparison. The first one is no, no action taken. The second one is to mitigate. And the third one is the strongest case of suppress and sustain. In each of these scenarios, we track a metric over here in the middle, which we call R. This is a critical metric and I would like to draw your attention to it. It is the reproductive rate of the virus and it measures the average number of people that each sick person infects. So in the top scenario, you see that R is estimated to be between two and three. That means each person with the virus has a chance to infect two to three others. In the second, in the mitigate scenario, where the government is, is doing social distancing, quarantine, testing, public education, things like that, it is estimated that R could go down sort of 1.3 to 2. So each person is only infecting 1.3 to 2 others. And then we've defined a third scenario where through a lockdown and then through careful control, the government is able to keep R below 1. And you can see from the right of the page that although there are some measures being taken between do nothing and mitigate, they have almost no effect on the number of infections and deaths over a 12 to 18 month period. We're talking over 100 million infections and a few million deaths. It is only when the government is able to keep R, that critical number, below one, that the number of infections are contained to a few hundred thousand and the number of deaths are contained to a few thousand. Now, we are assuming that the Pakistan government will be able to do what it takes to keep R below 1. No one really knows what it takes, so this is just our best guess, which is as good as anyone else's. Obviously, we are all in lockdown now, uh, and data about the current lockdown are coming in. The true impact of any lockdown is delayed, uh, and, and as we find out how effective this lockdown was, we will update our assessment of what it takes to keep R below 1 and, and what is the economic cost. Uh, but until then, this is the best available information we have. This slide is very important because it shows a sensitivity to R. Um, it is a simulation of what might happen to Pakistan across a range of Rs, starting from around 0 0.8, going up all the way to 1.7. But you can see on this on this on this chart, all the action takes place around one. For those of you who may remember their high school maths, this is an exponential process. And when the driver of such a process is below one, even by a tiny bit, the quantity collapses to zero. But when it's greater than one, again, even by a tiny bit, the growth is unfathomably large. So you can see if we are able to keep R below one, the number of deaths would be in the thousands. 
But if R goes even to 1.15, that's a hundredfold increase. We're talking 300,000 deaths and several million infections. And so, you know, the margin for error in controlling this thing is very low. That begs the question, what kind of actions would be required for this? This, this slide attempts to answer that, but first, I think it's relevant to talk about South Korea's experience. They had their pandemic largely under control, they were tracking all the cases, and then patient number 31 goes to a mega church and infects a thousand people, and this thing blows up completely. Now, South Korea were able to control their outbreak with economically non-intrusive measures, such as aggressive testing, contact tracing, you know, who's met whom, quarantine, technology, they had apps that tracked where people with the, with the infection were. Now, some of these economically non-intrusive measures will be challenging to get right in Pakistan for a variety of reasons, and we have details in, in our document. So our team estimated, based again on best available information, what steps the government would have to take. Now, this page shows the main measures to counteract COVID-19 sorted in order of economic impact. And as you can see from the two columns, the sustained phase, we the most economically intrusive restrictions are partially lifted. So the first column is the lockdown, where, where a lot of the measures are in place, and then we feel that some of them can be can be lifted. And, and our document has specifics about what we you know have forecasted for each of these different items. But on this next page, I'd like to draw your attention to the most economically expensive measure of all, which is industry closure. Uh, 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 McKinsey and company did this analysis of sorting all the industries of Pakistan in a two by two matrix. Uh, one axis is criticality to day to day functioning. So the higher you are, the more critical you are to day to day functioning. And the other axis is potential to propagate the virus. So, you know, the further to the right you are, the more um, uh, uh, the, the higher the propensity to, to, to propagate the virus. And, and this cut allowed us to, to, to think through what, what industries may have to be kept closed or partially closed in order to keep R below one. Again, our full document has all the specifics about what we mean when we say partial closures. And so page eight summarizes all the impacts of, of these actions. Uh, uh, the, this will be a very difficult battle to fight and, and, and will cause massive disruptions and this page summarizes all the impacts. I'll quickly go through and then, and then I'll just briefly talk about some of the details. So on GDP we're talking about a contraction of 10 to 15 points relative to the no COVID case. To give you some context, uh, this would be the first time in over a generation that the Pakistan economy has contracted in real dollar terms. Uh, the fiscal deficit, so it would cost the government a lot of money to fight this thing. We feel that the fiscal deficit will increase by 2 trillion, uh, which would then go from 8% of GDP to 14% of GDP. Uh, unemployment, we, we are estimating during the lockdown phase around 15 to 20 million people unemployed, which reduces to 10 to 12 as the economy opens up just a tad. Uh, food security would be threatened for about a quarter of Pakistan's population now during suppress. Uh, this will be mostly daily daily wage workers and then that number would go down to around 15 to 20 if the economy opens up and some kind of sustained period is achieved. And then there will be some impacts on uh, you know health, social unrest and crime. Uh, any, any economic recession in the medium to long term leads to uh, these impacts uh, for people who are uh, in low income groups. Um, so that is something for the government to keep in mind. Now we'll walk through a little bit of detail about some of these impacts uh, before we conclude. So on GDP, this chart summarizes our GDP impacts. I'd like to thank Professor Javed Ghani from our sister institution, the Karachi School for Business and Leadership, uh, for his wisdom and guidance about these calculations. Uh, this chart just shows that we foresee a net GDP impact of about $55 billion relative to the 2020 forecast. $10 billion of these is offset through the impact of government spending on citizen welfare and economic stimulus. Of the remaining $45 billion decline, about $37 billion comes from four sectors, real estate, retail and wholesale, manufacturing and travel and logistics. Our document has detailed calculations for each sector which shows the drivers and assumptions behind these calculations. Uh, but that, at a high level, these are the sectors that we expect would be the most hit. Moving on, um, uh, this page shows our calculation for the fiscal impact of the two trillion. 
By far the biggest effect is a decline in tax revenue. That's about one and a half trillion rupees. We have estimated this based on a decline in GDP of 10 to 15 points, as we said before, and also a small decline in tax to GDP ratio. Other big effects here are foreign aid. We expect to get about half a trillion rupees worth of foreign aid coming in this year. Um, a food and health expenditure of around 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 trillion. And then, and then the GDP stimuli of the government, you know, that would cost the government about half a trillion uh, of rupees. Uh, when you put all of these effects and the others all together, you get about two trillion uh, uh, rupee uh, impact on the fiscal deficit. Um, on the balance of payment side, what we, we expect to see, the, the significant reduction in imports to offset the reduction in exports and inward remittances by six billion dollars. Uh, so that would actually move in Pakistan's favor and, and you know after some other effects net themselves out broadly speaking this allows the government to reduce net financing activities this year by four to six billion rupees in order to uh, balance its books. This chart here is just to illustrate how we got to our unemployment and food insecurity forecasts. Uh, for the former for unemployment we took our forecast of full and partial industry closures and assessed unemployment effects industry by industry. The full details are in the document and that gets us to our estimate for both suppress and sustain. And then to get a proxy for food insecurity, uh, we, we broke down unemployment into normal wage and low wage, where low wage is defined as below minimum wage. So we estimated the number of people in the low wage category who, who would, who would uh, be unemployed and we adjusted for average family size and number of family members in the workforce. So that allowed us to get a proxy uh, on, the, on the total number of people whom we feel would, would be facing food insecurity, which the government which would then have to cover. So, so you know, there's, there's a lot for us to think about. There's a lot for the government to think about in the coming days. The GOP's actions immediately after the lockdown ends will be of utmost importance. Inshallah, the lockdown will allow the number of cases to be controlled and contained and hopefully even reduced. And just at the point that the economy is open up, it is critical to take some pages from South Korea's playbook and try and do aggressive testing, contact tracing, home isolation of suspected cases, quarantine and decontamination of localities with cases, and really try and keep this thing under control. And obviously, if this thing gets out of control, to take the difficult decision to go back into lockdown. To conclude, I would say that Pakistan is a very resilient nation. Pakistanis have great strength of character. And inshallah, if we all adhere to the wisdoms of the time, we can beat this thing. We should stay home as directed by the authorities. We should practice social distancing, uh, especially from people who are not well. We should wash up uh, in accordance with the regulations. We should try and keep our homes as clean as possible. We should donate within our capabilities to NGOs, charities and government funds. We should stay calm and report to the authorities if we display symptoms of COVID-19. And most importantly, we should try our best to remain positive, kind, compassionate and resilient in this difficult time. Uh, I wish all of you safety and security and inshallah may Allah keep us, Pakistan and the rest of the world safe. Thank you.